I'm Al Filreis, and this is Poem Talk at the Writer's House, where I have the pleasure of convening three friends in the world of contemporary poetry and poetics to collaborate on a close but not too close reading of poetry. We'll talk, maybe even disagree a bit, and perhaps open up the verse to a few new possibilities, and we hope gain for a poem or poems that interest us, some new readers and listeners. And I say listeners because Poem Talk poems are available in recordings made by the poets themselves as part of our Pen Sound archive, writing.upen.edu slash pensound. Today, I'm joined here in Philadelphia at the Kelly Writers House in our Arts Cafe by Davy Niddle, author of the chapbooks Empathy for Cars, Force of July, Horseless Press, 2016, and Cyclorama, The Operating System, 2015, a doctoral student in English at Penn who also curates the City Planning Poetics series here at the Kelly Writers House, and I'm thrilled to say is a teaching assistant, an amazing brilliant teaching assistant for the free non-credit open online course called ModPo. And by Christine Nelson, Drew Hines, curator of literary and historical manuscripts at the Morgan Library and Museum in New York, who has curated many exhibitions that explore what physical books, manuscripts, and personal letters reveal and withhold, including, to name just three of many, Charlotte Bronte, an independent will, Robert Burns, an old Lang Syne, and Oscar Wilde, a life in six acts who is author of The Brontes, A Family Rights, among many other works, and whose current project is this ever-new self, Thoreau and His Journal, a bicentenary exhibition that has been presented at the Morgan and also in Concord, Massachusetts. And by Erica Baum, a photographer who many of us in the poetry world consider a photographer poet, is that an okay phrase? I, I love it. All right, photographer poet, <laughs> which is to say she often photographs printed and written on paper and language as subject matter, among whose many exhibitions has been Foul Play at Thread Waxing Space back in 1999, The Imminence of Poetics, Sao Paulo Biennial 2012, and Photo Poetics, an anthology at the Guggenheim in New York 2015, and whose books include The Melody Indicator, Card Catalog, Dog Ear, and others, and whose work can be seen in the collections of, ahem, <clears throat> Metropolitan Museum of Art, wow, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Yale University Art Gallery, and many, many others. Thank you so much, Erica, for coming down from New York to hang out with us. Thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I mean... This is the first of many conversations we're having today. And Christine, so let's see, I'm guessing that you walked here, yes. not from New York, but no. from West Philadelphia. No, so. I'm a, as you know, I'm a good neighbor of Writer's House. Yeah, it's great yeah. that you, I and mean, we've been planning this for a while, and it's really exciting. That Can't wait to hear what you have to say about Erica's work. Oops, I gave that away, but we'll get to that in a minute. And Davey. Hi, Al. Always, always, always great to see you. Likewise, Al. Thanks for coming down the lane. Of course. Well, as I hinted, we're here today to talk about Erica Baum's dog ear, and specifically, three photographs, or pages, or poems. I like to think poems. The three that we'll be talking about are Fallout, Geisha, and In Closing, which are respectively plates 6, 7, and 12 in the printed book, which, by the way, one can get from Ugly Duckling Press of Brooklyn, New York, in a lovely edition. So I have to point out two firsts here. First, this is the only time in 126 episodes of Poem Talk, and maybe the last. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that to imply that it, it was going to go bad. That it could never I'm be just top. saying it's not something we do. <laughs> that the artist whose work we are considering is here with us to join in the conversation. Actually, I have to say, once Fred Waugh walked in on a discussion of his poetry two-thirds of the way through that episode. So this is, it's a first with an asterisk. But yes, Erica is here with us, and we're talking about her dog ear, exciting and unusual. Second, we don't have a pen sound recording of the poems that we're discussing, but I suppose we're about to make such a recording as I've asked Erica to read the three reading photographs. This is cool, to read the three photograph poems. So here now is Erica Baum herself reading Fallout, Geisha, and In Closing. Fallout. Thing else with mattresses on. Known limits and there. Fallout from quarrel. Cooling sins. Old, lovely, sitting, ruin. Very. 
That's one way of reading it. Do you want to do another one? Um, okay. Thing else with known limits fall out from cooling lovely ruin. Mattress is on and there. Quarrel, sins, old, sitting, very. It's another way. It's not the only other way. <laughs> Geisha. Skirts. Bee stung lips. Made up her face. It's a funny thing, care of a geisha. Glad you don't, itchiest dresses, on your, to put on dresses where she, the first when lips mate. In closing, I'm in closing, here or remain. You can also do now this. I'm turned with you if I, answering no, tiniest yes, so it is last me. Fantastic. Davey, how do you read such a text? How do you read such a text as these photographs? Usually my first question is not so quick and you were surprised. How do you read it? Tell us, give us yeah. some fundamentals of reading. Well, one of the fundamentals is to produce a relationship between uh, the decisions that you're making and the object. And I think that something that's really exciting about forming a relationship to reading this text is that you feel yourself deciding how to read uh, as you're reading, that uh, you feel if you're opening a novel, you're getting an authentic experience of the text because like here's the beginning of the chapter and you start there and you read it and you feel that you're doing a linear project. And here there's the discomfort of like, did I read it right? Do these words fit together in this way? What if I do it another way? And Erica, I found it really lovely that you were thinking about here's another way to read it because you also don't know when you're done. That I could just spend the rest of the day, I could just decide I'm gonna read Fallout for six hours and I'm gonna find all the different ways to read it. And so then I'm doing that work as I'm engaging with the text to decide when I've read it, if I've read it the right way and when to stop. Christine, you as a curator archivist are constantly facing documents, looking at documents that have been uh, partly burned, wet, uh, e eaten, uh, ink coming through the back. So reading, so one of the jobs you have is to figure out how are we supposed to read this. That, you were probably thinking of that when you encountered this, yes? Absolutely. I mean, my job is all about taking care of the physical objects that contain words and other kinds and of preserving written meaning. bad stuff that's happened to them because you want to preserve things at the moment that you've received well, them. Well, I, I right? mean, it restore? depends how you define bad stuff. I mean, people love to. You well, know, this project coffee is called, dropped on a test. Sure. Well, people love to talk about librarians who say no, no, don't dog ear, right? <laughs> um, and you know, we say that because when you dog ear. A page, especially, I mean, it looks like you've used mostly um, wood pulp papers. Yeah, like paperbacks. Paperback. Yeah, yeah, for the most part, yeah. So, you know, you fold the page and it breaks the fibers, and then it's much more likely that that corner will one day fall off. Right. So, or, and get grimy. So that's why we say no right. to dog earring. Right. I understand. Um, so, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, those of us who work with rare books and manuscripts and letters and so forth, we love to see the evidence of how things were used and interacted with. Mm. So, you know, we, we don't want the corners to fall off because we don't want to lose that. Um, but we love to see how people have marked and dirtied and soiled and just um, kept track of their experience because with a physical that, object. I'm going to ask you the obvious yeah. thing here because yeah. that discloses what? The well, everydayness of the way we deal with our books or... Well, absolutely. I mean, books are meant to be used. They're not really meant to be, you know, hung on a wall like a piece of art. So they're naturally going to show wear over time. And, it, you know, it's very interesting to see, um, you know, and wonder about, say, a little bookmark that somebody left in between some pages and wonder, was it just an accidental thing or was it deliberate? Did it Why did somebody something? mark something up? Right. So, you know, of course, my experience of Erica's work is very much tied to my experience working with the kinds of objects that she um, is manipulating and representing. Erica, there's a drama here. You know, the I love the word drama in this context. You know, the drama where... Uh, a, an artist working in a field, photography, 
where you're typically going to put something up vertically on a wall to present, this is exactly what Christine was just saying, is at war with the subject matter, which is books that you would look at flat and, and kind of deal with in a way that almost resists wall, you know, exhibition. Mm -hmm. So you are famously, thank goodness famously, because you are famous, <laughs> um, famously involved in the drama that's trying to, you're trying to put your art in a liminal space, you're trying to be between categories. Can you talk a little bit about that and what's it been like to wander over so often into the place where poets think of you as one of them? Um, well, it, it, one of the ways I can trace that history for myself is that um, I started photographing in graduate school, I started photographing blackboards, and I was looking at... At Yale, was at it? At Yale, yeah. And I was going into classrooms in between class, and I was photographing what was left on the board, and it was, a, it was kind of this moment for me where I felt like I'm doing something essentially photographic because I'm capturing something ephemeral and fixing it. But at the same time, I'm also engaging with language and also with this kind of more the question, like a sort of signifier signified question about linguistics and this feeling of like, what are we experiencing when we're removed from the destination of this, these words? So that was, that was a, a moment for me. And that basically was this, um, came out of studying anthropology, it came out of studying language, love being a lifelong reader, um, I would fast forward and just simply say that one thing I sum up always about this work is that it's kind of my homage to loving to read. Hmm. So there's there's lots of different threads, but that moment kind of started me on the path of looking at language. Mm -hmm. And that whole idea of looking at language and then presenting it this way in this sphere that you're describing was just one of those things where I, frankly, I didn't, I didn't think about what it might mean in the arena where it would be received because beyond being in school, you're not sure there will be an arena. So I wasn't yeah. thinking about it that way. So it wasn't a strategy. Yeah. It, it, you created a genre or a form out of your interests. Yeah. Okay, why don't all four of us quickly say what dog ear or dog earring, I guess it kind of is a verb, It is to dog ear a page. Can we say what, there are many connotations, let's go with four. Davey, you first. Just throw it out there. What's dog ear? One connotation for me uh, in folding over the corner of the page of a book that you're reading is the expectation that you're reading in a linear way. You're reading from start to finish or you're reading a part of a book from start to finish. I also have the connotation that it's somebody else's book, that it's a library book, that it's your mom's book. Because you can't mark it. Yeah, because you can't mark it, dog and so you're uh, having a physical relationship to something uh, in a minimal way because you can't have a more maximal physical relationship to it. All right, good. It. Christine, add one to that. For me, um, what's essential about dog earring is that it's irreversible. So once you put a fold... Spoken like a real archivist. Well, I mean that it's in a good way and a bad way. It is a static bookmark. It's not a dynamic one. Once you have marked that page... Um, you really, you, you can't, there's no, there's no going back. Mm, that's really interesting. Erica, add something to that. Um, well, dog-eared also has this con connotation of, of used, well-worn, and, and just in a general sense, which, um, not, not necessarily negatively or positively, but just that it comes with history, which is what I was thinking of when you described the works that you encounter all the time, that they have this history. And I'm going to add, and mine follows from Erica's, um, it expresses affection, love, this is a favorite page. This is a page whenever anybody asks me to find something in this book, this is. It's sort of like the equivalent of ripping the page out and putting it in your wallet, you know, having it available. It is probably an old technology for that because there are all kinds of ways of saving your favorite passage now. And that, so I have always read this work and I read it. I, I have to say I'm such a literature person that I read it rather than look at it, but I know I'm supposed to look at it. I read these poems, like these three, oddly enough, as love poems in, this, in a sense of, and it is a loving gesture to disrupt the 50% of the, of the semantic meaning that gets covered up and to love the crazy interactions that get result, that are resulting from this. So that's a great segue to maybe trying to do a close reading of the, I assume, quasi-accidental results We'll get Erica. This is the advantage of having you here. You can tell us, oh, I knew what I was doing when I dog-eared that one. So, Davey, um, you're on the spot. Pick one of the three. 
And let's try to do a close reading. Fallout, Geisha, and what's the third one? In closing. In closing. In closing. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, we're going to do collaboratively a close reading of a dog-eared page photographed. So weird. All right, Davey, you want to start, and then let's just all do it together. Sure. Uh, several things that I notice when I think about this are all of the physical words, uh, turned, remain, tiniest, that feel like they're about space or size that f end up feeling metapoetic if I'm reading this as a poem that make me think about uh, this as an assemblage of words rather than an interest in uh, making meaning that it's doing a sort of languagey uh, thinking about the materiality of language so like a word like remain makes me think about like all the stuff that's left after this process happened. Great. Christine you want to take it from there? Um, well First, I just want to say that the way I experience these is very much not the way you read them. And I know that you've created them in a way that allows many ways in. Mm -hmm. um, but I really resist um, reading them in a conventional way, which in a way is what you did. You mean reading you them as read if them they were. The right, well, reading them as if left they were right lines somehow. Left exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So for me, um, the way I read these. Um, first of all, is more visual than linguistic. But there is just no way to look at a word in a language in which I am literate without reading it. So I have this um, experience of looking at these and really just uh, settling on individual words or phrases out of the context in which they originally appeared, of course, which I don't have access to and don't want access to. Um, so just, um, you know, as you, you know, looking at the word, the words I'm turned, um, I can't help but see that the words are turning. Um, but I don't really want to, I don't really want to go on and read how that, um, turns out, right. How that turns out. Um, so the, the, but the, but of course I cannot not look at the first two words I'm in closing. And I have a lot of experience with enclosures being missing, um, because I work with personal letters and we always like when people save the envelopes or what was tucked inside, mm -hmm. but they're often separated from each other. So that is what that evoked for me. Um, and then the word remain is there too. Um, and we often don't have access to what remains. And that's sort of what I was talking about when I said what these physical traces reveal, but also what they withhold. There's always something missing. And what there's a lot missing here, and that is what the book is, what the book is. Um, how those sentences really turn out, what's on the other side. Um, so that's my So I'm going to add experience. mine, and then, Erica, you can either set us straight or probably <laughs> likely to say that the whole process is discovery for you as well, but that's your option. <laughs> um, I, when I read this stuff, when I'm trying to do a close reading in one of the pages, and I've done it intensely, and it's so much fun, I read it like, almost like I'm reading an aleatory poem, a poem created by chance or quasi-chance. The intention was you found a page 104 and 105 and you created a convergence semi-deliberately and then discovered with whether what you saw was going to be, make a good photograph and thus a photograph poem. But there is a chance operation involved. Um, so I wind up reading the poem. I am reading my reading of the poem. So I'm thinking, okay, if I were skimming pages 104, 105, because this is one of these easy novels, it's all narrative, I don't really need to like read the whole page, I might actually get almost something like, this is a little more of a viscerum, than I would get if I scanned the pages. It would be as if I just looked at the top corners and didn't do anything more but 105 does follow from narratively 104 typically I don't unless you messed up with the page numbers which I'm sure you didn't so I'm thinking what happens next and what we get is this incredible um uh what's it in photography where you uh you're create in card catalog you do this where you're create a four 
foreground the and foregrounding in other words everything becomes collapsed mm. yeah so i'm getting a kind of narrative collapse i'm not getting a photograph photographic collapse because you're taking a picture of the dog ear so it's not like card catalog but it's like card catalog in the sense that i'm skipping so far forward so basically i'm getting a narrative sped up accidentally so that the yeah the 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 no answering no is actually originally answering yes if you read it across right. the flap. So things are happening, and I'm completely at sea in a very pleasurable way because it's disrupted my reading, and I'm thinking, this is all I need. How I does have, that sound? Christine, yes. I have no desire to know what this book is and no desire really to see what's on the other side. I feel like it's entirely complete. Um, as it is. It's, it's in, I'm happy to hear that because I don't like to title them related to the books because I kind of wanted them to be free of the books. Yeah. And But um, to um, go back to actually to start with what Davey was saying, that um, I do think in this this piece in particular, but often I'm kind of thinking a little bit meta, meta poetically because I'm trying to like, to describe my process, it's one of... Um, chance and failure it's the it's like the premise that I've set up and then the execution of it which takes a lot of time and a lot of a lot of um, efforts that I then reject so there's a real consciousness to the ones that I don't reject and so you know I think you did identify something about this one that made me not reject it um, and then um, it's interesting in a way what you were saying about Christine about um, not wanting, resisting the reading, because then in the end, the associations it gave you kind of fit the reading, I felt. So, yeah. so that's kind exactly. of, you know, and in a way, um, I've heard um, different people read these. Initially, when I was first, when the book first came out in a different edition, Ugly Duckling Press asked me to do a reading, and I thought, what? I, thought, I can't, I can't mm -hmm. do that. And I invited another friend, a poet, Kim Rosenfield, to read it. And, and over the years now, I've heard other people read it. And the premise is that anybody can read it any way they want. But when I heard her read it, I thought, oh, that's not really how I'm reading it. And then I wanted to read it myself. And then I started reading it. But that doesn't foreclose the different ways that people are reading it. It just means that it made me, it heightened my awareness of the reading that I do in my head that allows me to make the selections I do. This is why you're a poet, because... A, uh, someone, whoever wrote this novel, I'm assuming it's a novel, but it doesn't matter, uh, didn't really want the greatest range of reading possibilities, probably wanted it to be read in order, pagination, narratively, because how would you get the plot? You know, if the son is reunited with the father at the end, like 60% of Victorian novels, you kind, the writer kind of wants that to happen. And you are a poet because poets want to disrupt reading to make it a metapoetic act. Right. That's one of the reasons why I think you're a poet, Davy. And yet there's something really different for me about the chance operation here and the chance operation in aleatory poetry or like somatic practice related poetry. And that difference for me is the fact that a dog-eared page is a chance operation or a way of abstracting language that occurs in everyday life. Mm -hmm. That it's making an argument to me about abstraction and abstract forms of, of language being something that people produce in a way that makes the narrative reading of a book one choice. That when you open the book to the page that you dog-eared, you're faced with two options. To read the abstracted language at, that appears over the dog-eared page, or to uh, continue to you know, unfold the page and continue to read the book as you've been reading it. And that's something that was particularly exciting to me about this work is that it isn't producing an operation to arrive at language in a chance way, but noting a way that that already happens in quotidian life. That's really key to how I came upon this idea because it comes out of like going back to the blackboards and then from there I started working the story of how I started working with another project called Card Catalog was that I was going to the classrooms for the blackboards and they were doing, high school students were taking a standardized test and so I was kicked out of the classroom and I went to the library. So, you know, taking, taking these sort of things that were having studied anthropology, being very conscious of people's actions in daily life. And so I was kind of trying to um, extrapolate from those projects into um, 
an idea that was a little bit more abstract that could maybe carry me towards finding other things. And that's exactly what I was excited about with this, was the feeling, and it goes back to photography, of the things that are around us are more than what we, it's like, it's like what we experience and yet more than what we experience if we notice it. So, yeah. Christine, I want to pick up a conversation, a, a somewhat of a disagreement that we had a few minutes ago, which I, we suppressed by moving on. And this was, uh, you said boldly, and it was sort of, it's sort of the job I'm supposed to do as a poetry guy. Um, you said, I'm not interested in the plot of the, you know, what was there before. I'm interested in what we're given here. That's sort of what you said. And I had been saying, and I sort of agree with you, but, and I was saying, I can't help but think about what this, what she's done to this presumably more conventional narrative. So I wonder if we look at Geisha, which get, presents a Geisha after the dog ear, how can we not, I guess my rhetorical question is, how can we not think, wonder, what attitude toward the idea, the figure of a Geisha, the original had? I'm just gonna guess that it was a more conventional attitude than Erica Baum has. <laughs> you would be right. Yeah, and that's not a bad guess. So. And also because the book seems very, you know, the page is very brown. It's probably an old book and attitudes toward the geisha, the figure of the geisha, have probably become a little more progressive, especially in the downtown art world. <laughs> so I think of, Christine, this is for you. I think of this as an exercise in thinking what was there before and what Erica Baum has done to, to change. Actually, the dog ear changes it ideologically. I think this is a feminist poem, and how the heck did she pull that off just by dog ear? Right. Does that make any sense? <clears throat> yes, and I, I'd like to add that I, I'm not interested in knowing what the book is or what the book says, but I am curious about the artist's process. Right. So that is something that I wonder. I wonder about what you tried and rejected. I wonder if you folded any pages that revealed a blank on the other side and whether you have included any of those in any of your presentations because it's always interesting to yes. see what emptiness reveals. Yes, yes, yes. So, okay, so yes. there aren't any in this Yeah, book, I don't have any something today, but done. yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so another question that was on my mind, and you can choose to answer it or not, but about your process is... Um, whether you deliberately chose very few um, passages with proper names oh, or absolutely. capitalized words. That's right. And I noticed that this is one of the few, mm -hmm. geisha, mm -hmm. and one of the other ones is another f sort of traditionally female-identified word, medusa. Mm -hmm. um, and then I noticed that there were, I think, two um, traditionally male names, Sam and Mark, right? But other than that... Yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's, it's um, pretty common words that you chose I tried, to focus I, on. I, I deliberately tried, I mean, I think it's actually kind of funny when you use names like Sam or Mark because yeah. they're sort of generic in right, a way, so that's right. kind of funny. But I tried not, I, I made that additional um, constraint in general for myself because I wanted to open it up more. And, and yeah. a, again, some names will tell us a book. I mean, not necessarily with these books, but it could. I but didn't want that names, to happen. You chose sort of Anglo names, yeah, okay. Anglo male names. Yeah. There's no, you know, Louise or... Right, right. You know, and then, but for female names, you didn't choose any associated with individual women, but rather this is a category, a, a profession. Yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's an interesting thing to notice. I mean, I wouldn't say, I don't really think of geisha as in the same order as Medusa. No. But it, geisha is more like a profession yeah, it's a profession yeah sure. um yeah. but but it's an interesting thing to notice that I, I yeah. it does pull out I don't I think I was um more conscious of a deliberate suppression than conscious of what I included oh all right and what can you say more about um what I was asking about blanks oh yeah well it's a, that's a great question because um some of my more recent work has been exploring that yeah and, um that also pulls my idea of maybe there's a narrative or something into a different place too, because then mm -hmm. we're more, it's more in our imagination. It, I'm giving you less, so I'm also allowing you more, so. Davey, um, I'm gonna create a ratio and you can react to it if you don't mind. Okay, so, um, uh, how does this work? A narrative is to someone else's rewriting of it, changing it, updating it, contravening it, 
as Erica Baum's choice of a text to photograph is to the result after the dog ear. Is that fair? Uh, in other words, are we talking about an intervention that seems a little light as intervention because she's not adding any text? She's not. Does dog earring count as a recanonization or narrative progress or updating or? Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does for a couple of reasons. One, because it's totally changing the scale of what's important, that all we get, we assume that these are different texts. Uh, they're materially very different yeah, from one another. We have typefaces and things. Yeah, and all we get of them is this snapshot of you know whatever this is, 20 words or so. And so it's making an argument for what of that archive is important. It also makes me think a lot about conversations in the digital humanities on 18th and 19th century novels on the great unread of just like, what do we do with all of these texts that aren't part of the canon that no one's ever going to work on? Can we represent... And no one's ever going to read? And no one's ever going to read. Can we represent quantitatively something about them? And this is a really different approach of can we think about the kinds of words that they use? And the conversation that you all were having about names made me think about how lovely and surprising the object world of these poems is. Uh, bee stung is really surprising. Uh, the word that appears in geisha as itchiest, the phrase itchiest dresses. Uh, lips appearing twice, skirts in fallout, uh, cooling, lovely, coral, mattresses, that these are snapshots of a really lovely density of exciting language, probably more so than is actually percentage-wise in the novel. And I think that this is a... Uh, really interesting intervention in saying there is a lot of literature that's part of our literary history that we're never going to engage with. Uh, what is a way that we can put it in conversation with practices that matter to literary production now? It's interesting. That reminds me of when I was in um, an undergrad and I majored in anthropology. I wrote at my Barnard. At Barnard. I, I wrote my thesis about changing roles. God, it's such a long title. <laughs> anyway, I looked at contemporary Japanese, 20th century Japanese literature, and I looked at family structure and changing family structure in, in Japanese literature. So I was consciously taking, I loved reading Japanese literature in translation, but I, I loved reading it, but I was actually often selecting books that weren't necessarily the books I loved and that I respected as great novels, but more the ones that served this sort of cultural question. And it's I'm always sort of conscious in a way of the these books as artifacts. So most recently I was at Powell's bookstore in Portland and because um, my son is going to school out there. And um, at Reed College? Yeah. And um, I was um, looking at old books. I'm really interested in the ones that, you know, would be discarded. And I noticed a sort of little bit of a theme that there were a bunch of books that tended and when I say a bunch of books I mean just wandering around the shelves um, up and down the aisles um, that were about the occupation in Japan. And that was interesting to me too, because it was sort of like, oh yes, there was this moment when America was in Japan and there was, you know, that was a, a moment. And we've kind of, for the most part here, unless you're a specialist, you're not, it's not as much part of our country, but it was in the popular imagination at that time. So again, it just goes to show that these things are kind of, there's there are ways in which they resonate and that they have a meaning to the culture as well as being literature. So. How about if a definition of experimental poetry, given this conversation, becomes this? Any process we can use to disrupt conventional reading, the kind of reading that makes us forget we're reading and be less self-conscious, anything that disrupts that, any mechanism, any device, uh, gets us closer to the experience of poetry that one wants, this is the experience of poetry that we that one admires. Um, that puts you in, for instance, as a, your distant cousin to digital humanities, which is something we wouldn't have thought, you know, before this conversation. That puts you in the context of aleatory poetry, of Jackson McClough using a computer to basically dog ear, you know, texts. That puts you in the company of Joan Retallick, who wrote a poem. Uh, not a cage, 
which is grabbing a few lines from books she's discarding from her library and lamenting that she never read them and she really feels bad about it. She feels guilty getting rid of her books. And so she preserves a couple of lines, the first and last line, and that's the poem. It's a distant cousin to yeah. that too. Does that, def, it's a wider definition of poetry. Does that satisfy anybody here? Christine, do you like that strategy of defining um, I guess I'm disruption? Not- Yes, absolutely. I'm just, I'm not very interested in trying to categorize what Erica does. Um, I, I would certainly say that it's a creative act and a disruptive one that works within constraints, but whether it's poetry or photography or simply um, uh, a companion activity to what we all do as readers and observers of the world, I I don't, Good, wanna, ca- I don't want to come down on one side. That's or cool. No, no, yeah. you called me and maybe by implication a few of us on wanting so badly to have Erica hang out with the poets. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, that's good. I share very much with Erica the interest in um, looking at something that is there and what is not there, like with the what was erased on the blackboard. Um, and drawing sort of new creative and surprising connections. So, for example, in my current Thoreau exhibition, I chose to show one of the contents lists. I know you're very interested in indexes and things. Yeah, I did a project that, about contents. Right, 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 exactly. <laughs> so when he would write in his journal, he would leave blank pages at the end so that he could later read what he had written and then make a contents list page by page. And it's an absolutely, to me, poetic experience to read them, you know, where you've got, you know, lots of lists of plant names and so forth, but right next to, you know, shad book, shad bush leafing and autumnal tints, you get meanness of slavery. Wow. And right across from that, dark night. Wow. And so I'm, you know, working within the constraints of what's on that page, but responding to, mm-hmm. you know, individual things in, in, in a similar way, I think, to what you've done here. And I think you've you've revealed that you reject a lot, right? Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. you have a kind of high failure rate? Yeah, or, yeah, that's right. a key part of it. Is yeah. it really? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting, because when I first started this project, it was an idea I'd mulled around in my head for a long time, and then when I actually started executing it, yeah. I was actually fortunate that I didn't have as high a failure rate. Maybe because right. I was just very loose. Like, well, but, that's just, but the more I do it, the rejection rate. M- rejection rate. Failure. I know. I, th- I say failure yeah. sort of as a yeah. joke, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Can you um, name two reasons why you would reject one? Well, it's evolved. It's changed over time because now I'll reject them if they're just too similar to something I've already done. So mm-hmm. that constantly happens. Do you ever you reject know? one? Where, oh no, this makes much too much sense. I really wanted less sense. Yeah. Um, that's that would be one, right? It could be. I don't recall that happening. Because some don't. of them make a lot of sense. I like but... it when they make a bit of sense. Mm-hmm. I, it's interesting because I'm, I, I welcome the um, invitation to be in the poet's world. And I, but I don't consider it to be um, something that means, implies any kind of loss of any other world. Mm-hmm. So I just kind yeah. of, I kind of like all the hats. That's a nice way to put it. We, we're getting toward the time where we need to sort of wrap up and offer final thoughts. But I, I think we should all look at Fallout, and each of us say one thing about that one, about that piece, to get us a little... I, I agree with something I think Davey said earlier. I think it's, that's a beautiful one in an almost traditional sense of beautiful. Uh, Davey, one, one quick idea about Fallout? Uh, something that's exciting to me about Fallout is that the spatial relationship on the page between fallout and cooling, the fallout's two L's immediately above the two O's of cooling. And something that I haven't noticed myself doing very much in looking at and reading others of these is to think about the spatial relationship between words. And uh, I've really been thinking about how all of the words fit together. But that's something that I never do when I read prose is think about the typography of one word sitting above another and that's such a beautiful thing here nice christine a thought about this poem i'm really struck with the um the blackness of the recto of the verso page versus the lightness of the type on the 
recto page. And I don't know if you deliberately heightened that with your um, It's just something that happens. It right. happens sometimes. And then the whiteness of the fold, um, as opposed to some of them that cast a little bit of a shadow to the point where I thought you were faking one of them because the shadow looked like it was going the wrong way. Mm. Uh -huh. um, so I... Um, Not fake. No, no, no. <laughs> Christine, does is there a paper chemical thing when you fold a certain paper and it creates that whiteness? Is are you are you breaking fibers in a way that? Well, you're definitely breaking fibers, and that probably has something to do with that. I mean, I'm not. It has to do with the the yeah. the weight of the paper and yeah. the light, and and yeah. some of the papers yeah. fold better than others. By yeah. better, I yeah. mean what I want from them. But I just yeah. want to say one more thing about my experience of this as a representation of a physical object, um, and that is that it does not reveal edges and. It is extremely pristine. It's a very crisp fold, very crisp cropping on the photo. And so it kind of erases a little bit of the tactile experience of that you must have had in handling this thing. Um, so known limits. Um, limits. Makes it, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm, I'm just going to point out that um, when I read it, I tend to skip... The, yes, the, I in, that. the the things along the line, or rather, I should actually say with all of them that I sometimes I skip words altogether. Sometimes I make a word up that comes from the combination. Um, I just realized that because it's what pulls out my attention, what draws my attention in the first place. So sometimes I think I'm gonna, but but I've also heard people read them where they made sounds up, like sound right. poetry. I along read that them line. as some as a kind of a punctuation mm -hmm. of a found punctuation. Mm -hmm. But I did notice you didn't read the word of, did you? Yeah, I, I, sometimes I'll read them, sometimes I'll skip them. Yeah, and I also, I thought it was a little bit unfair that on one of, I don't think it was this one, but you read the end of a word that we couldn't see. Yeah. Well, because, <laughs> because in a way, I think that when I'm deciding really? on it, I'll think, to me, that's what it says. Right. And in the end, I have the license to do that. Of course wow. you do. So. Uh, so let me let me throw out my <laughs> thought on this poem, and then we're gonna get we're gonna go around and get final thoughts on the whole conversation. Um, so I, I have I struggle with this in a good way. I see somehow I feel this bold font. I feel like it's old, but then the and I could be wrong about that. But then the vocabulary is somewhat new. Falling fall, the idiom of fallout from. Quarrel is on the next page, but one gets the feeling once you've got mattress there, you've got something domestic, and you've got fallout from a quarrel, even though quarrel happens on the next page. Um, so I set up in that way, I get a hyphenated neologism of quarrel cooling. And there's something about love and the domestic space where quarrel cooling becomes kind of a new thing. That, of course, got created accidentally. And, you know, I just spent, the first time I read it, I must have spent an hour on this one just trying to, trying to understand what's been falling out. All right, so let's, we could talk a long time about these and other poems, but let's go around and get just final thoughts on the conversation, really anything that you came here wanting to say and didn't yet have a chance to. So, Davey, you want to start? I want to add something to your sort of reformulated definition of experimental poetry, Al, uh, based on our conversation about fallout, and to think about experimental poems and to put these in that category of not only producing a disruptive reading practice, but inviting a natural predisposition toward disruptive reading, of making disruptive reading a shared practice, and uh, just as we had the thought earlier about this being a kind of natural or like quotidian disruption of uh, inviting a reader to notice all of the ways in which they engage with abstraction or disruption or gaps in language in their quotidian life. And I really find these, I'm gonna call them poems, super inviting and really warm. And that's often not f folks understanding of what experimental poems are, that they're cold or they're abstract or they're refusing the reader. And I really feel invited in by these. And that feels important. Fantastic. Christine, final thought? Um, I'm just very grateful to Erica for her reminder to all of us that when we engage with a text, we're also engaging with its physical form. Um, and that's true even when we are reading on our phone where we have a more gestural um, relationship, swiping and tapping and um, with the text. Um, so uh, 
this is a beautiful reminder of that relationship. Fantastic. Erica, final thought? Yeah, I would say that um, if you think of reading um, often as a kind of private act, then what I'm trying to do is kind of open it up and make it a conversation. So that's, I really love the fact that there are different ways to receive it because that just augments the conversation. So, you know, adding to a, a wider definition of art, um, co-creation of meaning. Mm -hmm. the co there's co-creation going on when you do the dog ear and you let the book talk to itself in a way, in a new way. There's co-creation when you're interacting with the choices that you make. And then there's co-creation as we are, we buy this book and have to figure out. Mm -hmm. uh, my final thought is about Dickinson. I, I just, I can't help but think about Emily, especially with enclosing. Yeah, well, I was too. <laughs> oh, good. I didn't know that. But it seems to me that... I'm happy to hear and you say the, that, and actually. The, of course, the, the, the Morgan represented by Christine, although I don't think you were the curator of that, with the great Dickinson exhibition there, which I hope everybody saw. It's not there anymore. Um, it just reminded us, as other work that's been done by people like Jen Bourbon and Susan Howe on Dickinson reminds us that scraps, bits, fragments, you know, we have Dickinson is the Sappho of the beginning of our time. And this just really makes me think, I'm enclosing, first of all, that kind of public private thing that she's doing just makes me think that this is so Dickinsonian. I'm yes. glad you like that. Yes. Well, we like to end poem talk with a minute or two of gathering paradise, which is a chance for us to spread wide our, our narrow Dickinsonian hands, you see, there's the transition, to gather a little something really poetically good or aesthetically good or curatorially good to hail or commend someone or something going on in the world of art. David, do you have some gathering paradise? Sure. Uh, so I have two chapbooks by uh, Brenda Ejima's Portable Press at Yo-Yo Labs that are just coming out now. They are uh, Soretta Morgan's Room for a Counter Interior and A Sea of a Dude's We Too Are But the Fold. Uh, they both came out in 2017, Soretta's uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, they're really amazing. Uh, it's a work by a couple of really incredible young poets. So you should buy these books and read them. Thank you, Davey. Christine, gather some paradise. Well, this year I had the chance to work with uh, the photographer Abelardo Morel, Abe Morel. You, you probably great. know yeah. him, right? Um, who came in um, to the Morgan with me to look at Thoreau's journals and made photographs of all the covers with all their great wear um, and turned them into this wonderful sort of map of Thoreau's life through these objects that he used. So I really encourage everyone to take a look at Abe's website to see this project that is an ongoing one of his. Fantastic. Erica. Um, I'm going to mention a group that was founded by Rob Fitterman called Collective Task. And um, he's been doing this now for a number of years, and I've participated. So I don't know if I'm going outside the rules here. but um, it, well, what, I did too. So okay. you're <laughs> shilling um, for something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, what the, the premise of Collective Task is he, he he's invited um, people from all over the world, although probably a lot of them are people he knows in New York, but he's extended it. And um, every month, some one person in the group assigns everybody a task, and they can interpret it the way they want. And most of the people interpret it poetically, but you're free to do what you want. It can be um, one time somebody said, I want everyone to give me $50, which didn't work out. But <laughs> you can. So anyway, Collective Task has a website. You can Google it and find it. Fantastic. Um, I just want to, I want to gather Paradise twice, the host's prerogative. Davey, I see you all the time. You are paradise. I'm going to save you for the next time. Um, the Morgan. You, if, you, if, if, if people have not gone to the Morgan in a few years, when was the renovation? Oh, uh, 11 years ago. 11 years ago. Yeah. I mean, people, people, New Yorkers in particular, people who visit New York once a year, they've been to the Morgan. Well, the, 11 years ago, it was transformed. It's, a, it's an amazing place. It's a beautiful place. And it's in the 30s. What's the exact address? Madison Avenue between 36 and 37. Yeah, it's just yeah. a revelation. So I highly recommend. And when you go in, if you're there during the day, maybe you can knock on Christine's You'll probably see door. a little poetry. And there's always poetry one way or other. And, and then uh, turning to Erica, um, Card Catalog, which has been mentioned, is just an eye-opening experience, uh, especially for young readers, lookers. Because unlike dog ear, where you know, most of us still are familiar with Aware, that technology. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was interacting with 
a person named Eves, who's a high school student in Palo Alto, who I met. Um, and there are a high school student out there and uh, looking at colleges and participating in Modpo. And they wrote just this morning in the Modpo forums, well, I like car catalogs kind of a cool thing, except I was born in 2000. Would that be right? Yeah, 2000, high school senior. And I have no idea what this is referring to. And rather than being sad, which I was first, I thought, but Erica has taken care of it partly. The experience of the card catalog, which is a little hard to only get in a photograph, has made Eves think freshly about all this, what indexicalness is and how we used to, prior to the ubiquity of computers, how we used to organize knowledge in that fabulously poetic and random way. Um, it's a great work, card catalog. Thank so, you. Well, that's all the fallout from quarrel cooling we have time for on Poem Talk today. Poem Talk at the Writer's House. That was supposed to be a laugh line, guys. <laughs> I right. smiled. So I'm going to try it again. That's, and, and Zach, I want you to keep this in, okay? Both, <laughs> both of them. The, the one that got no laughs. Well, that's all the answering no, tiniest yes. We have, <laughs> there you go. We have time for on Poem Talk today. Poem Talk at the Kelly Writer's House is a collaboration of the Center for Programs in Contemporary Writing and the Kelly Writer's House at the University of Pennsylvania and the Poetry Foundation, poetryfoundation.org. Thanks so much to my guests, Davy Niddle, Christine Nelson, and Erica Baum, and to Poem Talk's directors and engineers today, Chris Martin and Zach Cardner, and to Poem Talk's editor, the same amazing Zach Cardner. And a shout out to Nathan and Elizabeth Light for their very generous support of Poem Talk. Next time on Poem Talk, Billy Joe Harris, Alden Nielsen, and Tyrone Williams. We'll return to our studio here to talk about Amiri Baraka's late poem, Something in the Way of Things in Town, which Baraka performed backed up by The Roots. This is Al Filris, and I hope you'll join us for that or another episode of Poem Talk. <laughs>